Mr. Meyer, how are you, sir? Very well. Good morning, Mike, and thank you for having really me on. Really good to talk to you. My absolute pleasure. Let's start here. Um, Christians are often called science deniers, right? We're just science deniers. We don't believe in the science. When did Christianity and science become something that's at odds or at war with each other? Well, there were a series of books in the late 19th century in which uh, historians at the time recast the history of science as within this warfare model that you referred to. Um, one book was called The History of the Warfare Between Christianity and Science. And these were really revisionist works of history of science because if you go back to the founding of modern science in the period that historians call the scientific revolution between uh, say 1500 and 1750, even stretching back into the late Catholic Middle Ages, you find that the, founda the, the, the foundations of modern science were laid by deeply religious men who believed that what they were doing was actually studying nature for the glory of God. And um, they had a watchword during this period of time I'm talking about people like Newton and Galileo and Kepler and uh, um, uh, Robert Boyle. And they, they believed that nature was intelligible and could be understood because it had been made by a rational intellect, namely God, who had also imbued rationality in us. We were made in God's image. And so we could understand the, the rationality, the order and the design that had been built into nature. That was the, the, the founding premise of modern science. And there were systematic methods of, of studying nature that developed during this time that reflected that, that Judeo-Christian worldview. And the concept of nature being a creation that was contingent on the will of a creator. So we had to go out and look at it to see how it was actually put together rather than just doing armchair philosophizing as many of the Greeks did. So uh, by the late this late 19th century shift that came with Darwin, Marx, and later with Freud, and then with the historians recasting the previous history of science mm -hmm. gave us this myth of a warfare between science and Christianity that's persisted with us to this day and is now popularized by the new atheist writers such as Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss. Um, even Stephen Hawking got into the act a little bit before his death despite being a great figure within physics. So um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're battling kind of a myth about this, this conflict. And what I've shown in the new book is that the new discoveries that have been made in cosmology, physics, biology, about biological and cosmological origins are decisively refuting that myth and showing that just the opposite is true. We're, we're now returning to the perspective that gave us science in the first place. Mm, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so I've been a Christian for like seven years. And I remember growing up, particularly in high school, uh, like if you believed in intelligent design, you were, it was like the, you were an idiot. Like that's the stupid person thing. Of course you believe it. What, you don't believe in evolution? Of course, I mean, that's the, I, I, all smart people believe in evolution. Um, First of all, can you speak to that like cultural ethos that exists? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we call that the all reasonable people agree phenomenon, you know, where you have this false <laughs> consensus. You, whenever you hear scientists saying that there's a consensus about some proposition X, you know there isn't a consensus because you only invoke consensus to suppress dissent that's out there within the scientific community. Uh, if there's a real consensus, you don't you don't need to invoke a, a consensus. When no no one doubts that uh, H2O is the formula for water, so no one says that's the consensus. You only say that when there's actually a debate going on, and there's a there's a spirited debate going on within evolutionary biology that people don't know about, and that debate is about the adequacy of the Darwinian mechanism of mutation and natural selection. I attended a conference in 2016 at the Royal Society in London. The conference was convened by leading evolutionary biologists who are looking for a new theory of evolution because they think that the standard textbook theory, neo-Darwinism that we all hear about, is inadequate precisely because they don't think that the mutation selection mechanism has much creative power. They think it does a great job of explaining small-scale variations, but not la la major innovations in the history of life. Um, on the other side, uh, the evidence for design is piling up. Uh, if you look inside the cell, you find uh, little tiny miniature machines, uh, uh, rotary engines, sliding clamps, uh, little robotic walking motor proteins that tow material along vesicles to designated places where the cell can use them. It's an automated factory, all run at the, at the very most foundational level by digital code and a complex information storage, transmission and processing system in every sim simple cell. 
And th this screams design, and there's also a strong logic behind it because we know from our experience that whenever we see information, especially in a digital or alphabetic form, which is what we find in the DNA molecule, we always come, if we trace that information back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. Uh, Bill Gates here in Seattle has said uh, DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever devised. Uh, well, we know from experience that software al always comes from programmers. And indeed, whenever we see information in a digital or alphabetic form, it always comes from a mind, whether we're talking about a paragraph in a book or a, a hieroglyphic inscription or information across a radio signal. It's, it, the source of that is always intelligence. So the inference to intelligent design is based on our uniform and repeated experience which is the foundation of all scientific knowledge. So uh, you may have gotten ridiculed, but the, the basis of your, your sympathies for the idea, I think we're, are, very, are very strong. I uh, learned from you, uh, what you referenced earlier, that, that there's so much doubt behind the scenes among the evolutionary biologists. Uh, of course, in the front of the scenes, they they couldn't be more confident. This needs to be B Bill Nye, the science school, guy, no and the yeah, the, the, the public spokespersons for science. I call them Darwin's public defenders. You know, they're out in front <laughs> telling you that every, everything is is fine. Don't look behind the curtain. You know, but yeah. uh, people who are in the field know that there are very serious problems, and that this it's a mm -hmm. 19th century idea, for goodness sake, that was formulated before the information revolution, and. Uh, it has not withstood what we have learned about the informational properties of living systems. What I've learned for you also is that the origin of species, Darwin's origin of species, never even attempts to describe the origin of species, right? It talks about you know, evolution of beak lengths uh, of different types of birds, but it never actually talks about the origin. And, and I, I saw, a, it was Bill Stein's documentary about creationism, I'm sure you saw it. Uh, who did he talk to, was it Dawkins? Who, right. Uh, yeah. He, he, Richard he kept Dawkins digging and digging. In an interview yeah. With, where did yeah, it come with, from? Go ahead. Yeah, with, with Ben Stein. Yeah. What he was getting at was the the origin of the very first life. And uh, and you're you're right. Um, Darwin never addressed that in the Origin of Species. He attempted to explain how new forms of life arose from simpler pre-existing forms, but never where the first form came from. And that's what my I, my PhD research in Cambridge was on the origin of life bi biology. And by the 1980s, this field had come to a, a state of, uh, of almost complete impasse because pretty much as one of my dissertation supervisors told me, um, everyone in the field knows that everyone else's ideas aren't working, but they're not willing to admit it about their own. And uh, the problem is, how do, you, how do you explain this immense complexity of life that I was just describing, in particular, the informational complexity? It turns out that the, the basic chemical reactions that chemical evolutionary theorists have invoked don't move in a life-friendly direction. And so getting from chemistry to code turns out to be quite a trick, and no one has really figured out how that can happen without the active guidance of experimentalists uh, or experimenters in the laboratory. And even there, we, don't, we haven't built a full self-replicating DNA or RNA molecule. We've built some molecules that are somehow life-relevant, but um, uh, and only with the help of intelligent design. Um, sir, we have to run. I, I, I love Dawkins at the end of that. He's like, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Where did it come from? Where did that come from? Where? And the best he could come up at the end is, well, maybe aliens uh, from an advanced society came and planted life on Earth and left. That's the best that, that Richard Dawkins could come up with. Uh, I, Mr. Meyer, I, I hate I, we have I, to run. Go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I address that hypothesis, the alien designer hypothesis in the new book, and show that the God hypothesis is actually a much better explanation of the overall ensemble of, of evidence we have about biological and also cosmological origins. Where did the universe come from? No alien can explain that. Ah, Stephen Meyer, return of the God hypothesis, three scientific discoveries that reveal the mind behind the universe. Go buy the book right now. Sir, so grateful for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Mike.